Hi, this is Dr. Sage Breslin, and this is Breaking Through with Dr. Sage Breslin. Today, I have the just phenomenal opportunity to interview Dan Ellsberg. And I say that most people identify Dan with his release of the Pentagon Papers 50 years ago. But there are lots and lots of other things that Dan has done. He is an amazing uh, several times author. He is an educator. He is an anti-nuclear war activist. And he is probably one of my favorite polymaths. And if you don't know what that is, Dan just knows a lot about everything. And we are going to get a wonderful opportunity to interact with him today and hear a lot about the breakthroughs that he made in his own life in order to make the decisions that he made. So welcome, Dan. Sage. Uh, so great to finally get this opportunity to speak with you live. And I know that over the years, we've, you know, had a, a couple opportunities to chat personally. And uh, I've always found myself wondering uh, just how everything, you know, went down for you. And I had the pleasure of uh, actually reading this book, this memoir that you did. And one of the things that I was so fascinated by is the incredible attention to detail. And I don't know whether you have the most amazing memory known to mankind or whether you kept copious notes, but it was fascinating just to hear the step-by-step -step process that occurred for you before uh, you know, before life hit the fan. So I would love to hear what you're up to now and, um, you know, what are the things that excite you and and then maybe dig into uh, some of the story and some of the, the things you'd like to share with us. Unfortunately, what's going on now, Sage, is so familiar to me from long ago that it's uh, dismaying in many ways. When you say what excites me, in a way it's not exciting to find yourself that the world hasn't changed in the ways that I, I would have hoped that it would. Uh, we are, of course, experiencing on the domestic scene madness on a mass scale here in terms of the scores of millions of Americans who believe that Donald J. Trump is president now and that he got more votes. Uh, we're witnessing, in other words, uh, in, in, in real time, we're witnessing a madness uh, that was also exhibited in the climate denial and the denial of the pandemic in general. And uh, what I've come to realize is that in, in most of my life, the, uh, which pretty much spans the nuclear era so far, the, I was 14 when Hiroshima and Nagasaki occurred. I'd heard about the bomb uh, very ominously uh, almost a year earlier. It so happens very unusually. And so I was, uh, I was very dismayed to discover that this bomb, which we'd heard about as a hypothesis, had been made. It had been made by us and that we had used it on the city. And I found that very ominous. Uh, well, I, I wasn't wrong. Although there were periods when um, uh, I did think that uh, a war was almost inevitable before long, it, it hasn't happened. We have gone 70 years. Uh, I'm 90 now. So we've gone, uh, what is it, 75 years, 76 years, uh, without a new attack uh, on people. And um, there's two ways, <laughs> among others, two ways to look at that. One is that the, the threat was very overblown, that it wasn't really a danger, and that uh, we have adequate safeties uh, governing the situation so that we don't need to worry about it, don't need to do anything about it, or that we were extremely lucky. And I do think that it was the latter, that uh, it wasn't foolish to believe that we'd get in further Cuban Missile Crisis type situations such as I worked on in the Pentagon in 1962. And in fact, there have been situations uh, largely unknown to the public, came much closer than the public realizes. And I think the fact that they didn't, uh, that that didn't explode is uh, evidence of, is almost a miracle. And it could happen again. We could have another 70 years without a war. 
I think that would take as much of a miracle again. And we're talking about uh, to avoid that, we need a kind of change in international relations in the world uh, like that in the Soviet Union. Uh, the transformation of the Soviet Union, the, the existence of the Soviet Union and the Cold War, which a few years earlier than it occurred would have seemed not unlikely, but impossible. It was just impossible. I think, in fact, uh, people who aren't old enough, I'd have to figure out how old it would be, but it's pretty, pretty old, 50 or 60 years, can hardly imagine uh, an event so miraculous as the Berlin Wall coming down uh, under the on pickaxes of people. I don't know. Do you do you remember that? Actually, I, I do because I am old enough. But I have to tell you, I am horrified that the schools, our public schools, don't teach about what I'd refer to as near history. I remember being in high school and I had a media class. Now, this was not how to teach me how to use a computer or technology. This was a class where we dug into what was being shown on our news, what was uh, appearing in our world. And it gave us a, a chance to dig in and ask questions and really, you know, better understand what was happening in the world. There is nothing like that in the school system these days. I, even the private schools don't teach it. And so, you know, when I have done introductions to folks about this interview, if I'm talking to somebody who is maybe less than 40 years old, they may not even know what the Pentagon Papers are and certainly don't know about the Cuban Missile Crisis, certainly don't remember the wall coming down. It's, I don't know how to tell you of my despondency that our children are not learning about this incredible, you know, passage in history. And as you said, these things, while we have gotten lucky, I, I agree with you, it isn't beyond the pale that these things could happen again or with, that we might have a resurgence. And I'm not sure whether through nuclear attack or other, it's, it's, there's so little focus on this, at least for our young people. And I think that that is really dangerous. Well, the reason uh, the reason I mentioned the Berlin Wall so much is an example of something that was uh, a good event, uh, unlike, let's say, the things that stand out in our memory, like the Kennedy assassination or the start of a war in various cases. Something that was absolutely unforeseeable, yet did happen. And I mentioned that because I think for us to escape the consequences of the last 75 years of the nuclear era, which is almost identical to the climate uh, change problem, the the emission of CO2 has been in the atmosphere on an industrial scale has been going on for a couple of hundred years. But really, it was, I, I understand it, it was after the Second World War that it really took off in terms of the enormous emissions of CO2, carbon dioxide of the atmosphere, and the climate change problem, in, which has been accelerating throughout. I think I read um, uh, just the other day that um, this century, the, these 20 years, have seen as much carbon dioxide put into the atmosphere as all previous periods. We've doubled the amount. And this is well after uh, we were warned about it by uh, James Hansen, which I think was in 1987, 1989, somewhere around there, which is 30 years ago or more, and, uh, it, and how dangerous this was. And <laughs> now we're reading in today's paper, it so happens, the report of the International Commission on Climate Change for the UN saying that it's, it's now too late to avoid massive uh, climate change problems. The only question is how massive we can we can try to keep put a ceiling on it, or uh, but it's it's too late now uh, to avoid that there will be catastrophic events coming as a result of this. Well, yeah, when coming I that, and here, <laughs> yeah, and here yeah. it is here right now. So, and Paul Krugman this morning was trying to make a distinction between, say, even climate, which he said always looked like something in the future, even. Uh, although now it's happening right now, right. but the pandemic 
to deny the pandemic, as many millions still do, is happening right hour by hour and day by day as the uh, as the fires occur and the droughts and so forth. So the ability to live in a kind of false reality, in a denial of reality, to live in a world of alternative facts, as Kellyanne Conway put it, uh, describing Trump's uh, descriptions of reality, uh, is something we've, we've actually done for a long time. We've been denying the dangers of the nuclear era. And it, that's on the one hand. On the other hand, uh, intervention, essentially imperial interventions by the U.S. in the form of regime change or efforts to determine who rules other countries, uh, which we bring about by covert means often because they're illegal and they're we shock people involving assassinations, bribery, uh, military coups, dictatorships, uh, even invasions as in the case of Iraq and Vietnam. Well, I've participated in two moral catastrophes in which I was an active participant. And one is the buildup of the nuclear weapons in the nuclear era from late 50s on that I was involved in. And uh, second, the Vietnam War, uh, which I was a part of, even as a critic, internally as a critic. But I did my job. I did what was called for. And I participated. Uh, in fact, I had a thought this morning, Sage, that was kind of dark. I didn't, I didn't share it with my wife uh, this morning, but I'll, I'll just tell you. The concept of felony murder, where anyone who is involved in an illegal action in a felony in which someone gets killed participates in responsibility. It's guilty of murder, even though they didn't pull the trigger. They may have been in the getaway car or doing nothing, but it's a felony and it's um, uh, and someone is killed. It may be mass killing. Well, the people who went into Iraq are going into Iraq. Our country as a whole, I would say, is guilty of something very close to that. Felony murder. How many people have actually died? Well, the figures vary enormously because the American public isn't too curious about that. So uh, the lowest figure, 40,000 civilians by George W. Bush, it's probably 20 or 30 times that. Uh, and we get into the field, you know, a million, a million and a half. In clearly aggressive war, we had no right, we had no more right to be invading Iraq than, let's say, uh, Soviet Union had to invade uh, uh, Afghanistan, or that, or that uh, Hitler had to invade Poland or the Japanese, whatever. It was clear cut aggression. And uh, what I came to understand, maybe we'll get back to this, on Vietnam in terms of the Pentagon Papers was that our fight in Vietnam had been no more legitimate than that, which I had not understood earlier. I learned that from the Pentagon Papers in part. I'll describe what those were uh, for the, the younger listeners here. But uh, to realize then that I'd been part of something that had been wrong from the start, and therefore the people killed had been killed unjustifiably. They, it was unjustifiable murder, uh, killing, murder, at least second degree murder, if not uh, first degree. In other words, a, a, con a lack of concern for the dangers we were causing to human life in doing that. And I was a participant in that along with how many other people, you know, and, uh, countless, countless other people. I have a question for you, Dan. You know, I mean, you're you're opening up. We could be here all night. You know, I mean, you're you're opening up something that I think very few people maybe consider, um, which is, you know, where does our responsibility lie as people when we work? For instance, we work for somebody that gives us a job to do, and again, I could just make this as general as any military service person who you know, may take the job, uh, whether enlist or as an officer, because they are patriotic, they want to protect our country. But so much of the job that they're hired to do, maybe doesn't actually look like that. So where does the responsibility lie when the job that's given is to go in and to kill people? And, well, what, yeah, what you know, we don't we do? know yeah. oftentimes what the indoctrination is. I mean, I have worked with, uh, you know, military leadership and all sorts of service members for 
you know, probably 25 years. And so I, I've become privy to, to some of that information, but I'm, I'm really curious, given your contemplation this morning, you know, what your thoughts are. The notion of the Nuremberg trials uh, where they put the top Axis leaders, uh, eventually a larger number, but at first uh, 10 or 12 of the top Axis leaders uh, on trial came out with the supposed Nuremberg principle, which was that obeying an illegal order or a murderous order or an order to do wrong uh, does not give you an excuse. Uh, it does not relieve you of guilt of doing that, merely that you were following orders, that you were obeying loyally what you thought was right. What I've come to realize in the basis of studies and experiences, Americans don't accept that on the whole, for themselves or for others. They go with the assumption that um, uh, it's the, what you should do is subordinate, is having signed on, especially if you volunteered, but in any case, if you're in a military role in particular, uh, obeying orders is an excuse for anything that they, they just can't imagine it being right to disobey an order, no matter how wrong the order seems to be. Uh, it was very uh, striking, surprising to discover that uh, polls done, major polls, very Roper polls done for Herbert Kelman, a psychologist uh, later at Harvard, showed that people did not apply that even to the Germans, mm -hmm. that it had been wrong on the whole in the polls, about two thirds of the people thought the German generals, what they were doing was wrong, but they were right to obey it. They weren't wrong to obey it. Now, that if you could easily imagine they're letting Americans off on that basis. Very strange to see that they applied it consistently even to Germans, uh, that you aren't responsible, that you don't need to be uh, to take it into account. What you, let me ask you another question, that, and it's just an offshoot, you know, it's in my brain, so I might as well take the opportunity to ask somebody who might have a really justified opinion. You know, we have probably something like a suicide every 33 seconds of service members. I wonder, as a psychologist, if a large portion of those suicides comes from the weight of this responsibility and and the lack of any real solution to relieve that emotional burden. You know, I've done this thing. I was commissioned to do this thing. I did this thing and I can't live with myself. I'm just curious what your thoughts are. Well, we've certainly seen that. I've seen more in just in the last year on the concept of moral injury something I'd scarcely heard of before. It turns out there are a few uh, references to it. A guy named Shaler, a psychologist, did a, uh, an analogy actually of Vietnam to Achilles, to the Iliad, and uh, but use the term moral injury. And others are connecting large parts of PTSD with the foot falling mortal injury that you have been led to do something that injures your own self of your moral identity, who you are as a, as a moral person, is something that seems to you really wrong. You've been led to do it and you participated into it. Now, uh, with this very widespread PTSD, who knows how large a proportion, if any, this represents. For instance, the question is, how many veterans do come to believe or to recognize that what we were doing in Iraq was actually wrong, that we had no right to be there. I think that very many of them, perhaps nearly all of them, uh, in Vietnam, let me speak of, for example, as an analogy, came to realize that what we were doing was not being successful, would not be successful. And we were even unlikely to do things that would be successful if such existed. So they saw that the war was, as people have been saying lately, looking back on Vietnam, that it was not winnable. But there was another attitude to have toward it. And, and you can then say then you, you don't want to be the last one to die for this mistake, but also you don't want to kill for it. It's wrong to continue a war that is not going to lead to any, any better world, any better solution for anybody. You should stop it. And yet very few people, I think, think of that as a responsibility to risk themselves to stop it, just that they wish someone would stop it. Right. Um, when I, I was in that position for a long time, having been in Vietnam, 
And now let me go back for a moment to what the Pentagon Papers were. There was a 7,000-page top-secret sensitive, it was labeled, study of U.S. decision-making in Vietnam from 1945 to 1968, uh, the beginning of 1968, 23 years. It ended, by the way, at that point in the Pentagon because the people writing the study, doing it, and I was in the study, I wasn't running it, concluded that with Nick, with Johnson getting out of the race, supposedly to negotiate with the NLF, the North Vietnamese forces and the Liberation Front, that the war was over, that it was ending. Actually, it had seven more years to go. It had been wow. going on for 23 years, and it had seven years to go till 1975. But the later part, too, was prefigured in this earlier history. And uh, I was uh, working on the study. I worked on one draft in one volume, and another draft was used on the whole in the study. But I was given access to the whole study at the Rand Corporation uh, on a contract for the Defense Department to learn lessons from Vietnam on comparing these, uh, seeing if there were patterns in this 23-year-old course of events that could explain how we had gotten involved in what seemed like such a hopeless and unsuccessful project. How did this come about? What could we learn from it? And it wasn't really until 1969, I, I was first started in this study in 67. So it was completed in late, in early 69. In late 69, I began reading the earliest parts of that study, which I thought were the least relevant to the current period. They had to do with 1945 to 54, when the French were fighting uh, nationalist forces led by communists in Vietnam. And what we thought of is the French war. So why study that so much? People in Vietnam didn't bother to learn much from the French. They had lost two world wars except for our involvement. They were racist, if you can imagine that in modern terms, unlike us, of course. It's very ironic to look back on. But uh, they didn't, they weren't as strong. They didn't have as many helicopters. What do we have to learn from the French? So they didn't study it much. When I read the first parts of this study, which had to do with that part in, in late 69, I realized, first of all, not only that the war had been essentially the same in almost its nature uh, as we experienced, after all, it was against the same people, the same leaders in the same places, right. same areas. It was a, a repeat. Actually, it was a, a continuation. What we were doing was simply a continuation of the earlier war. But the second point was that it had been our war from the beginning, that we had backed the French in this as early as 45 and 1946. And by 49 and 50, we were paying 80% of the costs of the war to encourage them to keep in. So there would not be another area, quote, lost to communism like China. And that loss had been pinned on the Democrats uh, as if we had something to lose there as if we belonged to us or as if we had a way to change it. But we've come down the Democrats. And since then, no one had wanted, no president had wanted to be in office when another area went communist and where he could be accused of having lost again. And to avoid that or to postpone it, to delay it, I realized looking at this history was worth any amount of lives to them, any amount of risk, wow. uh, going up to nuclear war by the way. And so there's no limit to what, what could have been involved here. And um, uh, moreover, that from the beginning then, we had been backing what was a clear-cut colonial effort by the French to reconquer a, a province, a, a colony that had declared its independence and was mm -hmm. fighting for its independence. And for us to be fighting, you know, for reconquering a colony had no legitimacy for Americans at all, whatever legitimacy it might have in the eyes of the French, uh, who didn't disclaim their colonial past. But we had come into being against an empire, supposedly, in the world's first national liberation uh, movement, in a way, in the revolution. And we thought of ourselves as anti-imperial, which was a delusion. Uh, what is to be found from studying our history more truthfully, more recently, and so what happens here, I've just been reading a really good book by Daniel Sherson, a major who was in, uh, uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan and then taught at West Point. This, this book, it's hard to imagine because wow. it, it really shows that we have properly been regarded as an empire even from the beginning when our empire consisted of 
getting rid of the Indians, basically the yeah. uh, Native Americans here. And of course, a country based heavily on slavery from the beginning. Hard to imagine the way his students are uh, continuing to be in the army after they'd, they'd heard this course. Agreed, but, uh, agreed. Yeah, I, I have to talk to him about it. I really recommend the history. But in you fact, know, reading that now. That, that I, yeah, I, I, just to interject, something that it just strikes me. While I was lucky enough to have that media class, while my attention was directed to uh, the Vietnam War, I had one of my uh, favorite pictures that I have as a little girl was uh, of my uncle who served there. And I am, I was probably, you know, pretty small and I was handing him, uh, you know, an, uh, a daffodil before it had bloomed, a little yellow flower. And he was, you know, he had his uh, gun on, you know, slung and in his fatigues. And I just remember it was how I could think about him over there in Vietnam. I, I would stare at the picture. Okay, so even though I had this class, even though I had this, uh, you know, personal connection, I don't think that anybody ever even bothered to tell me that this war predated, you know, the late 60s. You know, to, to hear when I was reading your book and I saw that the studies went back so far, I thought to myself, okay, I got to keep reading because I don't know what he's talking about. And I was mortified that I didn't know. Well, you were in the position of nearly every American. Look, the, this top secret study had a kind of bland title, but it was U.S. Decision Making in Vietnam, 1945 to 1968. And if you looked at that uh, by almost any American, including in the government, the first reaction would be, if you really uh, saw what you were looking at, what do you mean 45? What decision uh, yeah, making were we making? It's what you're saying. What, <laughs> right. what decision making were we making in 1945? Right. Um, we weren't in Vietnam. What are you talking answer, about? The answer is we were. And uh, interestingly, by the way, a Vietnamese friend of mine who had been on all sides of this in a way in the course of 30 years, Tran Yuk Chau, but he was, uh, and, and another one, Wang Van Chi, was pointing out to me that uh, that the Vietnamese always called it an American-French war. Me for American-French, I forget what. But it was a war against Americans and French. And I asked him, he had been at that time a political officer for the Viet Minh, the communist-led national forces, although he was not a, uh, a communist, but he was a nationalist. And um, he, I said, uh, he said, yes, so we, uh, they all thought of that as an American war from the beginning. We should think. So when we were coming in, we weren't the new saviors coming after the French. We were just right. still there, you know, after the French had left. Right. I said, how could they know that? You're talking about illiterate peasants to a large extent, uh, knowing something that I didn't know at uh, back at Harvard. Here he said, how would they know that? He said, we told them. He said, they were political cadre. They went out, they educated, they had classes at night for the people. He said, they explained to them that the Americans were paying for this war, which was correct, and providing the munitions for it. So on the one hand, then, it had been our war. Second, what kind of a war was it? And the answer is a clear colonial, neo-imperial war that we had no business uh, supporting whatever. We were doing it. Why were we doing it, by the way? Not because we were in favor of colonies, but it was our relations with the French in Europe, the European relations, the alliance there. We wanted them to be close to us in part so they wouldn't object to our rearming the Germans, which they did start by objecting to for not terribly neurotic reasons. They had been invaded by the Germans uh, twice in that century, like, like as the Russians had. And to convince, them, to convince them that we should, just a few years after the Second World War, for economic reasons, build up the armaments industry and the arms in Germany, was something that had to be sold to the French. And one way to sell it was to help them regain their colony, which was, as I say, a motive that, that didn't justify what we were doing. So at that point, I began to see that a war, as I said earlier, that had been wrong from the start, as early as 45 and 46, um, 
it was not just a noble cause gone wrong or something that had proven infeasible or something, but something that had been unjustified from the very beginning. And that meant that it was murder to me, that it wasn't right to just um, uh, get out of it, uh, you know, gracefully and uh, without any loss of face or prestige. We lost our feed. Hopefully Dan will jump back on. God love editing. I would pause if I could. Give Dan a, a moment to log back in. Or maybe plug his computer in. There he is. Let's see. Yeah, I'm not sure what happened there. Actually. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, back so, to you. That's, uh, it's okay. The glory of editing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're back. So it's like if you think of a, a long series, let's say, like. Um, the Sopranos, where the young members of the family at some point in their lives are let in on the truth of what the family profession is, what right. they do, that we're the mafia, and this is what we do. And you've inherited that. And uh, as I recall, not too many people opt out of it. Uh, you know, that's, that's the family right. business, and here's what you do, and here's how you will make your father proud of you by uh, being a good soldier in this way. Well, waking up to the fact that we are an empire is something that, by the way, altogether took a long time for me because I thought of Vietnam as an aberration, as something we'd somehow gotten into. And it was it took a lot of study of people like this book by Sherson and, and others, I could mean, that um, to realize that it really was not an aberration, that what made it different was that the Vietnamese were fighting us on a much more larger scale and tenaciously than we usually encountered. It, you, it wasn't enough just to get an army coup on our side to replace a social democratic leader of some kind, uh, but we really had to fight. The same was true in Iraq um, and, and elsewhere. When you discover then that you're part of something that should not be had that's wrong, then what do you do about it? And one way would be to get out, simply to get out. But I will say, and you know, stop doing it. And some people did do that in the course of the war. What almost nobody else, I could say, did was to join a nonviolent movement of resistance against that war. It's hard to think of another example, actually, of somebody who did it. I don't have an, a good explanation for that. One reason being, that they, my colleagues, had never met anybody in that movement. They had no contact at all. I had the good luck in a variety of ways to come across to actually meet people who were doing nonviolent resistance to the nuclear uh, policies and to Vietnam and actually going to prison for it. And I doubt if I had one single colleague in the government who actually met such a person. Yeah. So I don't take credit for that. That just, I had the luck and the grace to meet such people, to realize that they were acting responsibly. They weren't fanatics. They weren't nuts. Um, they weren't um, authoritarian types of various kinds, Who, um, but they were doing what they thought was right. And they were right. 
and I felt the same way they did. And so had I not, this was another element, and around the same time that I read this in 69, uh, I actually met people, uh, Quaker Action Group, uh, Church of the Brethren people in some case, pacifists on the whole. Uh, but not all of them, uh, in fact, not even most of them, total pacifists, but rather opponents to this war, which they saw as wrong. And for that, they were ready to take the strongest, make the strongest statement they could that the war was wrong uh, and should not be participated in by anyone by refusing to cooperate with the process at all, by going to prison as nonviolent draft resistors. 5,000 Americans did that. 50,000 were in court proceedings uh, in connection with that, and many more than that uh, risked being in that position, hundreds of thousands, actually. But 5,000 actually went to prison. I'm not sure whether there's any other country that has had an anti-war movement uh, on that scale or in, in that intensity. And meeting, it was crucial to me then to meet people that I saw were uh, respectable, responsible, intelligent, conscientious people like those of my colleagues, but who recognized that the war was wrong, as many of my colleagues did, actually. They certainly recognized that it was hopeless, that it was not winnable, and then took this extra step that, say, whistleblowers like Chelsea Manning or Ed Snowden have taken, as they both put it. They saw information that needed to be out, and they saw that no one else was doing it, would do it. And then they took that third step of saying, so I'll do it, so I'll have to do it. And that's what uh, almost nobody reaches that third point. They say, well, this should happen. I wish somebody would do this. But the idea of actually risking their own career or going against their own internal sense of loyalty, of uh, reliability, of obedience, of having promised to keep secrets and so forth, to shed that in terms of a loyalty to what? To the Constitution, which is what they take an oath to, actually, uh, to uh, uh, human life uh, yeah. that is being risked by this, feeling some obligation for the lives that are being lost and acting on that. So I would say without that example and pinching on my life, which again was, I, to some extent I sought it out, but uh, to a large extent I just I was lucky to have connections that, that brought me into that and that had this impact on my life. Hearing in the last month or so, because the 50th anniversary of the revolution, revelation of the Pentagon Papers, uh, there's been a lot of, sorry, no worries. turn this off if I can. Okay. In the last month, because of the 50th anniversary of the, of the Pentagon Papers coming out, there's been a lot of talk about Vietnam and the Pentagon Papers and the allegation that the Pentagon Papers showed the war was not winnable. And actually, it doesn't show that. The Joint Chiefs, who are throughout the Pentagon Papers, that's their documents to a large extent, thought it was winnable, foolishly. Not that they had an actual way to do it, but if you did enough things, surely we've got to beat these people. How can they stand up to us? And so uh, they were sure it could be one. That was wrong. But Delusionally, the, but yes. But the Pentagon Papers show much more than that. It occurred to me, not one of these 5,000 people who went to prison, and not I either, did what we did because we thought the war was not winnable. Right. Nobody went to prison to protest a war that was not winnable. Right. They went to prison because the war was wrong and we were doing it. And as patriotic Americans, they didn't want the U.S. to be doing Thought they we should not be committing aggression, should not be committing an Im imperial war here, should not be killing people for the reasons we were actually doing it, which were not adequate. And uh, that's why they were, that's what they were trying to convey. And uh, had I not then met these people, had I not read the earlier part, which showed me what the war really was, and it so happened, third, I happened to be in touch with people still working for Nixon and Kissinger, Mort Halpern in particular, who was an official a deputy of Kissinger's, who told me that it was going to go on and get larger, not because Nixon wanted that, but because he believed that he could win the war by making threats 
that I was sure would not succeed and I believed would be carried out because to do otherwise would embarrass him politically. Uh, and he would carry those out. And that meant to me, the war is not over. It's not history. It's not in the process of ending. It's going on. It is not ending. It's going to get larger. Yeah. And so that, it seemed to me, I had to do whatever I could. And the Pentagon Papers, oh, you want to hold on just a bit here? I, have you not had, the, I, I'm not sure this has been in the whole time. Wait, let's see. Edit here a minute. Uh, is this any better? Can you hear me better? I think it's actually better without. Without? Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, quieter. But in a good way. <laughs> oh, now I can't hear you at all. No. So maybe plug back in. I'm not sure. Or if your computer picked up your um, one and then ditched the other. Not yet. So I wonder if on your, on your, so I can't hear you, but um, I wonder if try plugging it back How's in. This? Wait, oh, yes, this? perfect. It's okay. perfect. Yes. Okay. So. Um, so I'm yeah. curious, you know, one of the things, and I, I, I can't believe the time has gone so fast. I, I just feel like we, I blinked and, 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 <laughs> well, you know, go, we're, go ahead and you can yeah. edit it down if you want. You can yeah. talk about. So one of the things I'm very curious about, you know, you've talked about for you, what it meant to come to this sort of moral come to Jesus meeting, you know, the realization that, participating was wrong, that it was morally wrong, that that people were dying as a result of it, and that it was time to make a change. And it was time to show up and do what was right. If you could think about the things in your life that had occurred up, up until that point, was there anything that helped you make that decision, like stay very focused on on your heart, on your soul, that that made a difference, or made it made it possible for you to make that decision to move forward. You know, everybody has a unique set of experiences in their life. That carry them along. In my case, I had something that was not unique, but not that common either. When I was uh, 15 in 1946. Uh, I was in a car where my father went to sleep at the wheel and went off the road, sheared off the side of the car, and my mother and sister were killed. Oh and God. I was, uh, my leg was broken. I was in a coma for 36 hours and wow. in, in hospital for several months after that. But the, I think the awareness that catastrophe is possible really does happen, that your world can change. Uh, from one moment to the next, practically, in a terrible way. Yeah. I think uh, it does make it <laughs> a kind of a canary in the coal mine aspect in my life, in that I seem to be more able to imagine uh, that uh, disasters we seem to be heading for may be arrived at, may occur, may come yeah. about. And uh, things the the opposite side of the Berlin Wall going down, let's say, but you know, catastrophes of various kinds. That's that's one thing. Um, that may or may not be related to a, a an attitude that seems to me very natural and logical, but doesn't seem to be very widespread. And that is that having been part of the war, helping it, even when I was quite skeptical about it, that's another story told in my book, but I found myself working this war trying to understand the government from inside to improve its operations better in a war that I was not, did not seem promising to me at all. I didn't see it as an unjust cause, which I did later come to recognize. No, I saw it as, a, as a, trying to avoid communism for these people. It was a, a just cause. The question was, was it going to be uh, worth, uh, you know, justify the human costs on both sides that were going to be involved? And 
having been given it my best when I was working for the government in that, and I, I still was uh, later on, but when I came to recognize uh, first that it was, uh, well, even before I recognized it as wrong, when I recognized that it was going on to no good end, no, there was no foreseeable progress to be made here, I seemed to feel a responsibility that seemed very natural to me to try to end it. And as I say, that's never seemed anything other than that's just ordinary, obvious uh, thinking. It doesn't seem to be shared. I don't fully understand that. The other people, my colleagues, who were as conscientious as I was, and every, I don't put myself ahead of them in any way, but at most they got away from it. They left, they went to another subject. Almost none of them seem to feel any special responsibility for trying to get us out of there, uh, especially once they left the government. McNamara himself would be a very good example of this, leaving to go to the World Bank and, and feeling no responsibility. With the war going on seven more years after he left, it, not just McNamara, I don't know who spent any time, with one exception, Clark Clifford, who succeeded McNamara, did make efforts to see end the war afterwards and proposed cutting off the money for it. Mord Halpern, my, who had worked for Kissinger, ended up working on my trial, which made him unemployable in later uh, times. They did pay a cost for that, but that was very rare. It's hard to find any other examples. And uh, I think that has to change somehow. Uh, we got to change that. But another that another aspect, though, is that it was only my meeting people who were taking it on themselves to pay a price in their lives to go to prison to make the strongest statement they could that this war was wrong, should should end. Our our participation in it should end. That exemplified for me what I had been reading, another luck, that I'd met someone who introduced me to the writing of uh, Gandhi, Martin Luther King, uh, Barbara Deming, who writes on Martin Luther King and, and nonviolence in general, Rosa Parks, uh, people like that, that introduced me to the idea that nonviolent struggle in which you, as a resistor here to something wrong, are willing to take a risk to pay a price in your own life rather than to impose it on anyone else, rather than to threaten, rather than to uh, be violent, actually, you kill other people, but you allow, you take the risk that violence will be done to you and uh, or that you'll pay a price. Yeah. Just realizing that uh, that was open to us was a tremendous turning point in my life. When I very specifically, as I tell in the book, when I saw a young man named Randy Keeler, who I had come to admire in a, in a conference that I was of the War Resisters League, announce several days after I came to know him and admire him that he was on his way to prison, that was uh, a tremendous to cut my life in two in a way. It was such a shock to think that this young man uh, I thought was a wonderful representative of an American. Somehow, I, uh, this is an international conference. And I'm sort of glad these people from all over the world were seeing this young American, half my age, and then realized that the best thing he could do was to go to prison and that that's what had my, my country had come to and that that's how we'd fallen. That was a, a turning point in my life, and it was this emotional connection, this identification with him and what was possible. Let me tell you, just this morning, I've been reading, uh, we, we started talking about denial here, and I mentioned the Krugman column today in the New York Times about um, the fact of the pandemic denial, the climate denial, and uh, quoting uh, Florida's DeSantis, the uh, governor, who is not only not putting out a mask ma mandate, but trying doing all he can to prevent anyone else, any local community, any corporation, anything else, from getting people to avoid spreading the virus to their children or to other people, which seems insane. But then Krugman just mentioned in passing a reason for it, for DeSantis. If he were to change his position now, as he obviously should, you know, today, yesterday, tomorrow, 
it would hurt his political chances. His political ambitions would be gone. He was admitting that he had been wrong. He had been wrong up till now, and that would be uh, catastrophic to his political career. Now, that's just mentioned in context to show why for DeSantis, it's impossible. Impossible? Wait a minute. You know, why is it impossible? Uh, it's, it's unthinkable. You don't think of taking an action that would actually prejudice your ability to have status and have power in society yourself. In uh, I was reading a diary of a person I worked for in the Pentagon, John McNaughton, uh, Assistant Secretary of Defense. And at one point, he records himself in the diary as actually saying to McNamara, who on the one hand wants to get out of Vietnam, as does McNaughton, McNamara's Secretary of Defense. So at one point, it, quote, in an unguarded moment, Bob McNamara said to me, I so much want to give the order to those troops to come home that I can hardly stand it. But he did stand it. He didn't yeah. give that order. But then later, McNaughton tells him what he should do. Here's how we should get out, have a conference, be ordered out, this and that. He says, of course, if you did what I think we should do, uh, Lyndon Johnson would lose the election and your career would be over. Yeah. Okay, so dramatic, probably true. Is that a sufficient reason to make it clear that you don't do it? Yeah. No, it's, it, it's just unthinkable. It's not part of our norms to right. say that you should actually risk your own status in society to do this, which is what a few whistleblowers do in yeah. general. And it's why yeah. they're so rare. Yes. Well, I know that we are we have vastly and quickly run out of time, but I I wanted to mention something that you know, I think tags on to what you're talking about, which is, you know, where are we with our leadership? How do we develop leaders that don't have the fear of their own authenticity? And I think at Sage Wisdom Institute, a lot of what we do is to try to teach, and, and I dare say that we do teach leaders that by being authentic, by being human, that they don't have to fear that people will go away, that they that people won't follow them, that people won't trust them. But in fact, just the opposite, that when they become human, when they step into their roles as conscious humans, that people actually hear their message more clearly and are more likely to follow them. And so, you know, I'm, I don't know that we could have come to this at that time without people like you doing what you did. But I'm hopeful that as we model that behavior, as we model a greater authenticity and leadership, we might actually begin to move forward. I wish, Sage, that I could believe that, um, that it would be truthful to tell them you won't be at risk to DeSantis. Oh. Yes, you can win the election, even if you admit that you have participated in the unnecessary death of tens of thousands of your constituents, mm. uh, and that you admit that you were wrong and you change policy. Um, is it true to say to him that people thank you for that, for being honest and candid? Well, I, I, I can't say I don't <laughs> we've got to start that. somewhere, right? I mean, I'm talking about the education of our well, up-and-coming leaders, hopefully. <laughs> well, how about some other people? Now, I did talk, I have talked just recently to a woman named Rebecca Jones in um, Florida, who actually was fired and uh, sued and various things going, even trying to prosecutor and so forth, for telling the truth about the fact that she was being pressed by people in DeSantis' office, in the, in the governor's office, to lie. To lie about what? To lie about how many people were actually dying. So as to make it look as though he didn't have to have a mask mandate, and he was right in doing what he was doing. And she told the truth. Now, I... I would not start with DeSantis by trying to convince I don't think so that there's, either. <laughs> that there's no risk here. Right. Uh, I do think that I, I would like to see people take heart from the example of Rebecca Jones. Um, 
uh, there that you can tell the truth and not be destroyed by it. Uh, we're not all running to be president or governor or senator or whatever, right. and can imagine, but also being willing to see that it can be worth a risk to our own career and even to our family in terms of career, or in terms of college education, everything else, that where there were many, many lives at stake, we should take account of our effects on other people in the human family, other than, quote, us, we, uh, that the them out there, the others, are also worthy of being taken into account, and, and that we can't just write off any amount of harm to them in terms of uh, good for us. Yeah. I, I can aspire to that. That's a change. It's not individual. Humans see that very well, uh, and they live on it. But groups, hard, hard to convince them. Corporations, how about that? They, uh, they don't think about others very thoroughly, you know, as opposed to this quarter's, this quarter's yeah. earning. I mean, hopefully we are, you know, we are growing our level of consciousness where we can see that there is no us and them. You know, yeah. that we're all human and that we're all energetically connected below the surface. Uh, you know, I understand that that's an aspirational goal. Yes, the, you know, I think that to say that there's no us, if I may say, if there's no us in them at all, that as Obama said, there's no red states and blue states for all purposes. That wasn't right. There are red states and blue states. <laughs> and I think it's human, it is human, inescapably human to see that uh, there is various us's, we groups, groups that I identify with, not just one, that get larger and larger, but that there are a lot of people who are outside that we. I think that can't be escaped from. And the question is, is it fatal or not? And it right. might be. But what I would aim at is saying that the we should not believe that the them, the others, they, are entirely different from us, that they don't matter at all, you know, it's not, it was not excessive for BLM, for Black Lives Matter to say Black Lives Matter, because, uh, of course, what, they're, what they are bringing attention to is there that that needs to be asserted. It doesn't go without saying it all, because uh, to very many people and for practical purposes, they didn't matter. Uh, let's say to a lot of police, the way they're trained, uh, working in the in the ghettos and the black, that for practical purposes, black lives did not matter. And what you're asserting there is you're wrong, or it's not a matter of wrong. You should change your perspective, your identity, mm -hmm. as to who you're concerned about, you know, and who you're obligated toward, and what your loyalties are. And it's not, I think, I don't think that the idea is to say, I care about their children as much as my own. I don't think that's going to be achieved. But how, so. recognizing that they are human, that they do deserve some concern and some consideration, and that you should take that into account. And in many cases, when you do that, that answers the question of what you should do. That There are many things we do that can be justified only if a lot of people that we're harming don't matter at all that it just doesn't matter at all. And that is a very common, unfortunately, I've come to realize, it's, that's human. That's a very common way of thinking as humans. It doesn't seem to me impossible to move away from that and to get more of a sense of a common humanity and a common obligation mm -hmm. and loyalties. Uh, that, um, uh, and if we don't, I think... Uh, we are we are doomed, but I don't think that's impossible. That's why I mentioned the Berlin Wall at the beginning. Uh, that and let's say Nelson Mandela again earlier coming to power in in South Africa without a violent revolution was impossible. It was seen as impossible, but it did happen. It did and happen. We have to aspire to change. It's uh, it's like it's like ending a war to recognizing that a war is over and that we no longer should apply wartime standards to uh, rights and to what we have a right to do to other people. Mm -hmm. We've never done that after the Second World War. 
the Cold War and the Cold Wars that go on, the War on Terror, tell us always that a, a wartime presidency, a wartime uh, standards here of, of our right to kill other people have persisted. If we can end that war against other humans and recognize that we really do have common uh, threats, and the threats are our own military to a very large extent, our own weapons, our own military, our own military industrial complex, mm -hmm. not that they should be exterminated, but they have to be challenged and confronted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, Dan, um, we're out of time for today. I could keep on talking to you for hours and hours, but I think that you you made an incredible start for us as a country and as a humanity. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, I am looking forward to all of our viewers uh, getting a chance to listen to your words of wisdom and to all of the breakthroughs that you made along the way in order to challenge the system and, um, and make a change that, uh, you know, nobody else was willing to make. And thank you, Sage, for the opportunity. All right. Thanks so much. And we will be back next week with another uh, wonderful breakthrough with Dr. Sage Breslin.